Hey everybody, Dr. Stevens here, and uh, a number of people asked me for a video on building and dealing with decision trees, so we'll do it in a few parts, and this is part one, that is actually building the tree. So we're going to use an example that we haven't looked at before, but I think it's a pretty good example in terms of complexity. If you can do this one, you should be able to do pretty much any one that I happen to toss your way. The problem deals with a young man named Sean who's graduating from JMU and has possibly is getting jobs with any of three different companies. We'll call the jobs Job A, Job B, and Job C. He's already had interviews with each of these companies and he knows that over the course of the next several days he'll be getting phone calls from each company telling him whether or not they're offering him a job. He definitely has some preferences about the companies. His favorite is job A. He'd be delighted to get that. It gives him a utility of 120 points. Utility is a measure that, for example, economists will often use in terms of how desirable an outcome is. You can think of them as happiness points. Job A is his favorite and worth 120 points. The second best, job B, which is worth 85 points to Sean. And if he doesn't get A or B, his third choice is job C, which isn't bad, but is only worth 60 points, half as much as job A was to him. There's a little bit more going on here. He's going to get a call from each of the employers, as we said. And if he gets the job, that's terrific, at least if he gets the offer. But they may tell him, no, we don't want you. So he's going to have to decide what to do when he gets the call because unfortunately, if a company makes an offer, then Sean at that time has to either say, yes, I'll take it or no. And if he says that he's not taking it right now, they won't make him another offer. So what's going to happen? Well, it depends really on what order the calls come in and uh, how likely it is that he gets each job. Here's the details. He knows that he's certain to be offered C. It's his backup choice, his fallback position. It is his least favorite, but obviously it's better than no job at all, which would give him a utility of zero. He thinks that it's 50% likely he'll be offered job A and 60%, slightly higher, to be offered his second choice, job B. But they're not independent. He's being compared to other people in the market, after all, and so if he finds out that they don't want him for A, he's probably not the hot shot he thought he was. His chances of being offered job B will drop from 60% to 40%. In the same kind of way, if he's not wanted for job B, he figures his chances of being, dropped, have, of being offered job A drops from 40% down to 25%. On the other hand, if he is offered job B, then his chance of also being offered job A climbs to two-thirds. All right. Sean's phone just rang, and it's about job B. The other two calls will come in later, and either order is equally likely. By the way, if you want some practice with this problem, it's interesting to roll back the parts of the tree where job A is the first one that calls, or job C is the first one that calls. You can see whether it makes any difference to Sean and which one he'd prefer. It's a good little exercise. But for today, we're dealing with a situation that we have at hand. Namely, the phone just rang, and it's about job B. All right. Well, he's an EMV, or an expected mean value person, uh, expected monetary value, or mean, ex expected monetary value is what it stands for. So he's going to make his decision based on the best average payoff. Remember we said that not everybody agrees that average payoff is the best choice to use in a one-shot like this. If it, in a repeated situation that happens over and over, everybody agrees that expected payoff is the way to go. In a one-shot, you may want to take into factor factor in feelings of risk love or risk aversion, but that's not for part of this problem. He's an expected value person. The best average result is the one he's going to go with. All right. Our first step for doing this work is to list all possible decisions and chance events in the problem in two lists, one for decisions and one for chance events. In each case, we're going to list not just the events themselves, but the, the choices that could result from that event. So don't just say, for example, traffic light. Say the possible out outcomes. The light could be red, or it could be yellow, or it could be green. So how about Sean's problem? What do we have for decisions? Well, it's not really hard, is it? He doesn't have to make a decision unless he gets a call from someone, at which point, if it's from job A, he has to decide to take it or refuse it. If it's for job B, take or refuse that. If it's for job C, take or refuse that. Those are the only decisions that Sean has in this problem, the only ones that might come up. Notice, by the way, that they won't necessarily all come up on every branch. If he's offered job A and takes it, any later calls are irrelevant, for example. How about chance events? What chance events could occur in the problem? Well, they're related to the jobs, aren't they? He could be offered job A, or maybe he isn't. He could be offered job B, or perhaps not. He could be offered job C, or not. There is one more chance event in this problem, though, that we haven't talked about. Take a second and see if you can see what it is. 
it's this. After the first call comes in, there are two more calls to come, and we don't know what order they're going to come in. A could call before C, or could call after C. So those are our events. What we want to do is to take all of these things and put them together into a decision tree. On that tree, we will have some squares. A square always represents a decision that we're making. And we'll have chance events, and those will always be represented by circles. A square is where you decide what happens. A circle is where chance decides what, what happens. And in order to get things in order, you might want to keep this in mind. Decision trees are always red and built from left to right. And if you put your finger anywhere on the tree, then everything to the left of where your finger is at that moment is history. It's stuff that you already know. Everything to the right of where your finger is, is mystery. It's the stuff that you don't know yet. So in the picture that we have right here, the finger is on a decision node, the, the square to the left is something that already happened and you know what you decided. But the square to the right is a decision you'll have to make in the future, and you don't know what that decision is yet. The circle represents a chance node, and if you happen to choose the lower branch from where your finger is now, something's going to happen, but you don't know what it is yet. All right, let's put all of this stuff together. We know that the call from job B has just come in, and we had three decisions about whether to accept each job or refuse them. We have four chance events, whether a job's offered or not, and who calls after B calls. So out of these things, which comes first? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? I mean, we just said we know that the, job about call, uh, the call about job B has just come in. That's something that we're going to have to deal with. What deals with job B? Well, we have a decision whether to accept or refuse the offer. And we have a chance event, whether we're offered the job or not. I'm going to say we for Sean, just to make it simple in terms of our talking. Well, does it matter which order these come in? Does one have to come before the other? Yes. We can't decide whether or not we're going to accept the job until we actually have the job offer. If we're not offered the job, we don't get to make a decision about whether to accept the job or not. And what that means is, of these two events, the one that has to come first is a chance event. That is, whether we're offered the job or not. This particular decision tree starts with a chance node, and this surprises some people. Many, many trees start with decision nodes, but there is absolutely nothing that says that a tree has to start with a decision node. They can, enter, they can follow in any order as well. Chance can follow chance, decision can follow chance, decision can follow decision, chance can follow decision. They can be strung out in any possible order. This particular tree starts with a chance node, and that means I'm going to have to add a little bit extra to the branches that are coming out of it, namely the probabilities. There's a 60% chance that the job will be offered, and a 40% chance that it won't, according to our original discussion. So our tree starts with a binary, a two-way chance node. There's nothing that says it has to be binary either. There could be more choices than two, but in this problem it kind of naturally comes down to just, just, just two choices. Now, if the job is offered, let's follow and see what happens next. The job is offered. What's going to occur next? Well, I hope that you'd say that if he's offered the job, he has to decide whether to say, yes, I'll take it, or no, I won't. What shape should we use for that? Right, a square. So the tree now looks like this. If he's offered the job, he could refuse it, or he could accept it. The simpler branch is the one that I'll put in first, because I like to keep things simple. The simpler case is where he decides, I'll go for job B. When he does, he gets a payoff of 85 points. That's how much B was worth to him, and that's really the end of the story. So a few things to keep in mind. First of all, a decision tree can start with either kind of node, that they can go in any kind of order, and that the decision nodes don't have probabilities because you get to pick which way to go. When I come to the end of a story, like I do with accept B here, I'm going to put the payoff at the end of that branch, indicating how much better off I am at the end of the story than I was at the beginning. Here he had no points when he began, he had 85 when he was done, and so he's 85 points better. Notice, by the way, in some problems you might have something where over the course of the problem maybe you gain 100 bucks and then lose 30. Your payoff in that case would be 70. It doesn't matter that you had 100 and lost some. It's how much better off you are at the end than you were before the beginning. All right, we have the other branch still to worry about. What happens if B is offered to him, but he refuses to take it? So what happens next? Well, he's going to have to sit around and wait for another call to come in. And what we have to know is who's going to make that call. It could be A, it could be C. They're equally likely, so both are, have probabilities of 0.5. Let's work on the upper branch, even though both the upper and lower are about equally difficult. There's no reason to do one before the other. So our history so far is a call came in from B. 
it made they made him an offer, but Sean refused that offer, and the second call that came in was from A. What happens next? Well, that's pretty simple. It's a chance note. Either A is going to offer a job, or they're not. So we have two possibilities with the two branches. But things are a little more complicated here than you might think. Take a look here, for example. There should, after A offers the job, Sean has to decide whether or not to take it. So there should be a decision node where the arrow is pointing. I haven't put one in. It wouldn't be wrong to include that decision node of Sean accepts, Sean rejects. But this is Sean's favorite job. So if he's offered the job, it's a no-brainer for him. He's going to accept it. In the same kind of way, we've got a similar thing going on in the lower branch. If A is not offered, we should have a decision node about whether or not uh, Sean is going to accept the third job that comes in, which will be job C. But if he doesn't accept it, it's three strikes and he's out. At that point in the tree, he's got a choice of accepting a job which gives him 60 happiness, or refusing that job too, and not having a job, and getting zero happiness. That's a no-brainer as well. These no-brainer decisions are examples of what are called dominating strategies. One strategy dominates another if, no matter what the chance events that are in the problem, that choice is always better than the other choice. Here, always accepting your favorite job when offered is a dominating strategy, and taking some job rather than not having any job at all is also a dominating strategy. So we don't have those decision nodes there. One more thing about this picture. We were told earlier that the probability of A being offered was 50 percent but here it's two-thirds why well we were also told that if he was in demand enough to be offered job B Sean's chances of getting job A go up to two-thirds that is this probability is a conditional probability the chance of being offered A given that he was offered B in our decision trees conditional probabilities will always be conditional upon something which is earlier in the same branch as we're currently working right now we're working on the B was offered branch and by that log logic too, of course, the chance of not being offered the job is one-third. All right. Let's go down to this branch. Recapping the story, the call for B came in. Sean was offered a job by B but refused it. And now the second call is from C. The logic runs pretty much similar to what we've already done, but let's take a look. First thing, are they going to offer them the job? Well, C always offers him a job, so we don't need that chance note. Instead, we need a decision. Is he going to accept the offer from C, which will give him 60 happiness points, 60 utility, or refuse it? He might refuse it, hoping that A will come through for him. If he does refuse C, oh, there's the 60 for accepting the job. If he does refuse C, then A will eventually call, either making an offer of job A or not offering it. And either way, that's going to be the end of the story. We see the same two-thirds, one-third probabilities that we saw earlier. Because he is desirable for, prob for job B, there's a two-thirds chance he's desirable for job A as well. And if he is offered A, he will accept it, that same idea of dominating strategy, which will lead to a payoff of 120. If he's not offered the job, though, which happens one-third of the time, his payoff this time is going to be zero. Why? Because he's refused two jobs, and the third job, the one that he really wanted, wasn't offered to him. He ends up with no job at all. So if you put all this together, you end up with our upper half of the tree, which looks like this. This tells you what's going to happen, what could happen, if B does make the call and is offering him the job to begin with. We have the other half of the tree to build. What's it going to look like if B doesn't offer the job? And I invite you to give this a try, to... Stop, stop the video at this point and see if you can build the other branch on your own. After that, come on back and we'll look at it together and see how you did. All right, here's the lower branch. Let's talk about some of its highlights. We're starting, we're talking about the situation, of course, where B is not offered and see what happens next. Well, in that case, Sean's going to have to sit around and wait for the second phone call and find out who it's from. It's a 50% chance of being from A, a 50% chance of being from C. If in fact it is from A, the job's either offered or not. But notice that this time, the probability of being offered is only 25%, because if B is not offered, then Sean's not the competitor that he thought that he was, and his chance of getting offered A drops from his original estimate of 50% down to 25 If he's not offered the job, notice that his payoff is 60. Why is this? 
Well, because if he was not offered B and is not offered A, C is the only job left around. Better to take it than to not. So when the call from C comes in, it's a dominating strategy to take it rather than not. Once again, putting a, a decision node on this branch to say accept C or not is perfectly good. I've saved a little writing because it is a no-brainer. How about the other branch? If the second call is from C, then he either has to accept C or refusing. Accepting C is easy because remember that C always offers him the job, so he can always accept it and get 60. But he may decide to refuse it, holding out for A. This is a chancy strategy. Because he was not wanted for job B, his chances of being offered A are only 25%, that conditional probability we talked about before. If A is offered, fantastic. He gets the job for 120 payoff. But if it's not offered, then which happens 75% of the time, once again, three strikes and he's out. He has no job and his payoff is zero. So putting that all together, the entire tree looks like this. It's a pretty big structure and there's a lot going on. But if we roll it back, if we figure out what it tells us to do, we'll have Sean's optimal strategy. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the next video, part two on decision trees. I'll see you there.